this is pretty much hands on and we will approach the issues and questions from um, the practical Swedish reality. And we will start with the European order for payment. And here we have the special Swedish system because the competent authority is the Swedish enforcement authority, Kronofogden, which is generally not seen as a court, uh, but is uh, the authority responsible for enforcement issues. But under the regulation, uh, the enforcement authority is seen as a court. And I would also like to highlight a certain issue because when it comes to uh, EU regulations, the Swedish legislator usually issues complementary national legislation on issues. And we have two of those connecting to the regulation on a European order for payment. And that is an act of 2008 concerning a European order for payment and a regulation on a European order for payment. And the application to, to the enforcement authority should be made by mail. And it can be made in Swedish or in English. And the application fee is 300 Swedish kronas, which is approximately 30 euros. So it's not very, it's not a very high fee. But important is that the fee must be paid in advance. And when it comes to service, uh, it is the enforcement authority that is responsible for service of documents. And the main form of service used in this context is service with receipt of acknowledgement. And this can be compared to the national Swedish level because if the debtor has a digital mailbox, the enforcement authority has started to use a digital service, but this is not available uh, when it comes to European orders for payment. And what happens if the enforcement authority fails to serve? Well, that is regulated in paragraph six of the 2008 act, then the application is dismissed. And when it comes to time frame for service, we talked to the Swedish Enforcement Authority and they could actually not specify any given time frame when it comes to service because it varies so much depending on whether it is a national or a cross-border case. Uh, so it actually from, from the Swedish point of view, it is not possible to, to set a an average time frame for service. And responding to the service, what should the debtor do? Well, sign the acknowledgement of receipt and return it to the enforcement authority in the included envelope. That is one way of, of doing it. The other one is that the debtor sends an email to the enforcement authority, including the case number, the name of the debtor, social security number, and the name of the applicant and or his or her legal representative. And the acknowledgement of receipt is only evidence that the debtor has actually received the information on the claim. and it doesn't mean that the de debtor accepts the claim. And what are the requirements before the Swedish Enforcement Authority, Authority issues a European order for payment? Well, the, in particular, two questions are addressed. Does the application fulfill the formal requirements? Is it a civil and commercial case? 
Is it a cross-border case? Is the regulation applicable in time? And then uh, the enforcement authority makes a summary control of the costs of action. Is the claim well founded? Well, this is an uncertain concept in Swedish law, but what is actually checked is whether or not the claim is obviously unfounded or not. And the point of departure is the information provided by the applicant. And a decision is usually issued in 30 days after the fee of 300 kroner has been paid. And what happens next depends pretty much on the debt there are three alternatives. The debtor can comply with the claim and pay. Secondly, the, the debtor can remain very passive where he does not contest and does not comply with the claim or contest the claim within 30 days. And this defense must be signed by the debtor because otherwise it will not be dealt with. So the first situation, what happens if the debtor complies with the claim and pays? Well, he or she shall inform the enforcement authority in writing that uh, the claim has been, has been paid. And then the applicant withdraws the claim. And the enforcement authority closed the case after the applicant has notified the enforcement authority that he or she withdraws the claim. The second situation where the debtor does not contest or and does not comply with the claim. Well, then the Swedish enforcement authority will issue a decision that the European order for payment is enforceable. And this decision is sent with approximately in 32 to 35 days to the debtor because there is a frame of 30 days where, where the debtor can oppose to the claim. So shortly thereafter, the enforcement authority will act. And a decision to the to declare a European order for payment enforceable cannot be appealed in Sweden. And this follows from paragraph 12 in the Complementary Act of 2008. So what's important here is that the debtor must act and not be passive. And what happens in the third situation if the claim is contested? Well, then the case will be transferred to court if the applicant so requests. And I think this is an interesting feature of the regulation because the debtor has a certain uh, leeway to dispose of the applicability of the regulation in that sense by contesting a claim. And if the claim is contested, the enforcement authority will close the case. And the, in addition, the case will also be closed if the applicant does not request a transfer to court. Uh, so then the enforcement authority will also close the case. And the court will try whether or not the claim is correct or not in a summary fashion pretty much similar to that one that the enforcement authority makes. And in addition, to contest a claim in a Swedish court may entail additional expenses. We have the court fees of 900 Swedish kroners, approximately 90 euros. And then uh, the, you have to pay an additional fee of 600 Swedish kroners for transferring the case from the enforcement authority to court. And then there is always the risk of having to pay the costs for litigation. 
And Liz Pendens turned out to be a very problematic uh, question from the Swedish point of view. And Natalie, she has spent several days <laughs> looking into it. And please, Natalie. <laughs> Tell Thank us you. what you learned. Thank you. So, uh, regarding the requirements for lease pendants in Sweden for the EOP, our study shows that this actually might be a problematic case. And the principle of lease pendants means that the same issue uh, between the same parties uh, should not be processed simultaneously in different processes at the same time. And for the EOP, the relevant situation in Sweden would be the one where the applicant takes his or her case um, both to the enforcement authority under the EOP procedure, but also to Swedish district court for the same claim. So how, sh how should this situation be resolved? And under Swedish law, uh, the principle of lease pendants is regulated in the uh, Swedish code of judicial procedure. For the EOP situation, this is actually problematic uh, of two reasons. And the first one being that this legal document is in general not applicable to the actions of authorities, but only to courts. And uh, a second reason is that the lease pendants paragraph mentions trials in Swedish, but the process in the enforcement authority is in fact not a trial at all. So this uh, might cause some problems. So we see here that the fact that the EOP in Sweden is administra administrated in an authority and not by a court uh, might cause problems for this lease pendant situation. So uh, scholars have stated that the provision on lease pendants in the code of judicial procedure actually expresses a general principle uh, of rule of law and that it thus is applicable also to the procedure in public authorities. So through analogy, uh, the problem seems to be solved. Well, however, in practical life, the situation might still be complicated. And uh, in the case um, shown in the PowerPoint, the Swedish parliamentary ombudsman, the GEO in Sweden, criticized the enforcement authority for handling the same claim in two different procedures uh, at once, as this did, did not respect the principle of dispendence. But in the same case, uh, the GU also stated that in practice, it might be very difficult for the authorities, if not sharing the same systems for registration, administration, to actually detect such flaws. So in practice, the GU said that it must be up to the defendant to contest this additional procedure. And nowadays, the enforcement authority has routines to avoid this case of double registration. But if you look at the case with the EOP, the situation is actually not resolved as the enforcement authority and the district court, which would be the alternative, uh, they do not share any kind of system for registration, administration, and they do not cooperate in any way. So the principle of lease pendants under the Swedish system would depend fully uh, on the action of the defendant. And this particular issue has not been settled uh, in Swedish courts. So in summary, the conditions for lease pendants in the EU procedure uh, is formally clear under Swedish law, but might cause problems in practice as the EU is handled not by courts, but by an independent authority on the Swedish law. Yes, Natalie, thank you. I think this is a very interesting question. And then as Vesna said initially, uh, the regulation is uh, an alternative to national procedures. And Sweden has uh, national rules uh, found in act on payment orders and judicial assistance. And you can see on the slide here that it is a big, big difference between the use of the national procedure versus uh, the European uh, procedure, because usually the national payment orders issued every year uh, exceeds 1 million orders. Whereas in the year 2000, 
2020, there were only 350 European orders for payment issued. Previously years, the numbers have been approximately 150. So there is, and I think this also uh, highlights but what Vesna said initially, that the awareness of the European order for payment procedure must be highlighted more. And I think here we, we, we need to, to work and, and uh, show that these instruments actually are available in cross-border situations. And the differences compared to Swedish national small claims procedures uh, are, I think at least three differences should be highlighted because under Swedish national law, an application can be made digitally. Whereas when it comes to a European order for payment, an application must be filed on a standard form. So here we don't have the technique to aid us. And moreover, a decision will be valid and enforceable in all of the European Union without further ado. However, uh, the regulation is not binding or applicable in relation to Denmark because of the Danish exception. And moreover, there is no need to attempt uh, court proceedings. And when it comes to the latest Swedish case law uh, on the European order for payment, this is where we meet difficulties because there is a problem in Sweden with overview of different cases. Uh, we have to use various forms to search case law. And one is the UNO database that it, uh, is used by uh, typing in keywords. Natalie will return to that just in a moment. And then we have uh, notices of important case law on InfoTorget. Uh, but here we have a problem, especially from a private international law point of view, because cases that actually concern various EU regulations are not referred to as private international law or, uh, uh, but referred to as procedural law. And then as a reader, you think this is only a national case and you don't realize that it is actually a cross-border case. So that is problematic. And if you have the case number, you can contact each court, but the, but that doesn't give us the overall view if you don't have the case number. And moreover, the case number varies depending on if it's a district court or uh, the court of appeal. But Natalie, could you add something on the search with keywords? Uh, well, as a, a law student and a research assistant on this project, uh, I just wanted to confirm that uh, researching the case law uh, before this presentation, it's uh, the system in Sweden about the administration of case law is unfortunately uh, very difficult because we don't have a general system. And even if there um, are databases, you have to search for keywords. And it's not always very clear what keywords are used and the result might be very uh, differentiated. So it's, uh, it's a big challenge to create an overview of the case law. Um, in this subject and, and in, in Swedish case law in general. So mm. it has been a challenge. I have, and also that uh, regarding the um, um, district courts in Stockholm only, we have four different district courts and I have emailed them all this morning to get case law for this presentation. And you can understand that it's a very time consuming process when you don't have this um, prepared general um, statistics and data of the case law. Yes, thank you. And now we will leave the European order for payment and move over to the European small claims procedure. Uh, here we have the competent authority, which is a district court. 
and complementary uh, legislation connecting to the regulation is act on small european uh, on european small claims procedure and uh, to institute a small claims procedure, you have to pay a court fee of 900 Swedish kronas. And the question concerning whether counterclaims are allowed in a small claims procedure. Uh, first of all, we need to address the question on jurisdiction. And here, According to the Brussels I regulation, a Swedish court that has jurisdiction concerning the main claim will have jurisdiction concerning a counterclaim if the counterclaim was founded on the same contract or facts as the main claim. But however, if the counterclaim exceeds the th uh, threshold of 5,000 euros, the claim and counterclaim is not proceed proceeded within the ESCP regulation, but according to national procedural law. And short, very briefly on Swedish law on counterclaims, uh, there is a jurisdictional rule similar to the one in Article 8 of the Brussels I regulation, uh, found in Section 10 paragraph 14 of the Code of Judicial Procedure, and the court with jurisdiction to hear the claim has jurisdiction over a counterclaim. And under section 14, paragraph three of the same code, uh, cases might be joined if it is the same or connected, if the cause is the same or connected. But another requirement specified in section 14, paragraph seven, is that the same form of litigation must be applicable to the claim and counterclaim so as to be able to join the two different uh, claims. And finally, the Swedish remedies. Uh, you can appeal. And the appeal will be handed into the district court and that must be done in within three weeks according to paragraph six of the 2008 complementary act. And the district court will hand it over to the court of appeal. And also the court of appeals decision may be appealed to the Swedish Supreme Court, but you might have to have a leave of permit prior to that before the Swedish Supreme Court tries the case. And in case of default judgment, an application for reopening shall be handed into a district court within one month, according to paragraph five of the complementary act. And then of course, we also have uh, the remedy of review stated in Article 18 of the regulation. But that is only very ex under very exceptional situations. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>